this gorgeous button hover effect. Those three little dancing dots as someone types you a message. Confetti bursting on your screen as someone congratulates you. These tiny moments turn everyday experiences into something delightful, engaging and informative. Today, we're diving into the world of micro interactions and showing you what they are, when to use them and how to create them. At their core, micro interactions provide additional information where static transitions simply can't. They're generally triggered by some user, network or system action and typically animated, meaning they have the dimension of time, allowing designers to convey feedback quickly or slowly. For example, this subtle animation on LinkedIn's reaction picker lets users know that other choices are available outside the usual like. Another example is WhatsApp's dancing three dots, triggered by a network action, i.e. your friend messaging you. It makes conversations feel dynamic and almost mimics the ums and ahs of a real life conversation. Micro interactions can also be a matter of expectations. For example, if you upload a file, at the minimum you'd expect a file progress bar to appear. Without that, you have no confirmation of your action, whether or not the system is functioning properly. Finally, the upload progress animation can actually make you perceive the waiting time as not being as long. Like these indefinite progress bar animations, they literally convey no information on progress at all, but reassure users that something is happening behind the scenes. And sometimes micro interactions impart a bit of playfulness on the user experience. These pricing cards have a glow effect controlled by the mouse position. Users understandably will need some time to decide which pricing tier to go for, and this serves as a bit of playfulness as you make that important decision. These small design moments work together to create a seamless user-friendly experience. When users feel confident and at ease navigating your product, they're more likely to stick around and enjoy the journey. When you start noticing them, we see micro interactions everywhere. When you tap the heart to like a tweet, it expands, changes color, and releases a playful sparkle animation. Dragging down on the feed reveals a rotating loading icon, giving a playful alternative to the boring refresh button. It also frees up space on the user interface, reducing clutter and making room for more important things. Press and hold the like button on Facebook and an array of animated reactions like laughing, sad, angry, pop up for you to select, adding personality to the interaction. So is there a general playbook on when we should use micro interactions? Well, micro interactions aren't meant to be sprinkled everywhere. In fact, doing so might actually hurt the user experience. When done with purpose and intentionality, they enhance specific moments in the user journey. Here are key moments where micro interactions make a meaningful impact. To provide feedback, whenever users perform an action like clicking a button, submitting a form or uploading a file, they need reassurance that the system has registered their input. Micro interactions like button animations, success messages, or progress indicators ensure users feel acknowledged and informed. To indicate system status, users can feel frustrated or even confused if they're left in the dark about what's happening. Micro interactions can keep them informed about system status, like when a page is loading or a file is processing, enhancing transparency and reducing anxiety. To highlight interactivity, not every element on a screen is clickable or interactive, but users need a way to identify those that are. Micro interactions like hover effects, button highlights, or sliding switches can subtly indicate where users should be focusing their attention. To guide users, micro interactions can help users navigate unfamiliar interfaces by pointing out what to do next or providing contextual hints. This is especially useful during onboarding or when introducing new features. When setting up a new iPhone, Apple uses smooth animations to guide users through step-by-step -step processes like enabling Face ID or transferring data. And finally, micro-interactions can be used to add delight. They exist purely to bring a little joy to users. These moments of delight may not be essential to functionality, but they make the experience more memorable and human. Twitter's sparkly animation when you like a tweet adds a touch of fun to an otherwise routine action. Are there instances where we should tone down or even remove micro interactions entirely? And the answer is counterintuitively yes, and it depends entirely on your users. Somewhere deep in the iOS settings menu is the option to reduce or stop motion. Similar options are available on Android, Mac OS, Windows, and other operating systems. Among various reasons is motion sickness and vertigo as a result of dynamic zoom and transition animations. This is known as vestibular disorders. 
Screen shake and parallax scrolling are a few interactions that may trigger undesired discomfort among users. You'll most likely design your app static to begin with. And at the point you add animation, it's important to bear in mind accessibility. And that means not introduce animations that make your app uncomfortable to use. Testing and obtaining feedback is key. Making sure that the animations work for the UX rather than be an arbitrary animation for the sake of polish or flair will ensure that your app is going to be useful and enjoyed by as many users as possible. Now that we've covered what micro interactions are, when to use them and when not, how do we actually create them? Well, they can be created in a number of ways from flipbook sprite animations exported from a program like After Effects or using a JavaScript animation library like Framer or GSAP. I'm going to show you two examples, both coded using pure CSS. I like this approach because it doesn't require any third party software, which can be expensive and take time to learn, which is related to my next point in that there's minimal learning. You're already using JavaScript, CSS, and HTML to create these web apps. Furthermore, the source code stays in the same place as your website code. Finally, it's optimized for the browser. There's no need for external libraries. Everything works natively. Within CSS animations, we have two options. First is to use transitions, and the second is keyframes. I'll show you both. In this example, we'll create the reaction picker from LinkedIn using CSS transitions. First, we start with a button, add a thumbs up, and give it a bit of styling. Then the reaction picker is simply a flex div with content centered and spaced using the gap property. A bit of box shadow and rounded corners. To keep things simple, I use emojis inside a span element, but you may want to use something a little more professional by the way of vector icons. Finally, we position the picker UI absolutely and adjust its top and left values to position it like so. CSS transitions need only three lines of CSS. How the animation starts, how it ends, and how we get there via the transition property. Allow me to illustrate. I've omitted the styling apart from the parts required for the animation, but I've shared a link below where you can view the full source code. We define a start property and the end property. Then we can use JavaScript to add a class, thereby controlling when the end value is used. Now that wasn't exactly the most exciting transition. To do this, it's simply one more line of CSS. We define which property we'd like to animate, the duration of the animation, and the timing function. This can be used to create smooth motion. Tweak the animation by updating the values on the transition property. Using a linear timing function means there is no smoothing and the square moves at a constant pace. Here, a timing function that uses a cubic bezier, which lets us draw curves by modifying the control points. These values are better known as ease in out. We also aren't limited to using JavaScript to dynamically add the class, in this case, end. We can use any selector. Here I use the hover pseudo class, meaning that the element will initiate the transform transition when the mouse hovers on it, like so. Let's apply this concept on our reaction picker emojis. Let's first start with the reaction emojis. We use the selector to select the span element that contains the emojis. We can then offset them vertically like so. This is our start position. Now we need a selector to define the end position of our emojis. We'd like our reaction picker to appear when we hover on the like button. So that's a good place to start. I can nest the selector like so, thereby grouping all hover selectors together. Now we see the start and end properties when hovering. With a little transition, this starts to come together nicely. Next, we'll make the emojis fade in. We can piggyback off where we previously defined the start property and place opacity zero. In a similar fashion, we can define the end property. We then need to change our transition property from transform to all so that both the transform and opacity properties are animated. Finally, we'd like our reaction picker container to fade in and out on hover. We can use these selectors to define the start property, the transition, and then define a new selector under button hover pseudo class to define the end. And voila! we have a usable reaction picker micro interaction. What about keyframes? This heart button animation is made entirely with CSS keyframes, the second tool in the CSS animation toolbox. There's a teeny bit more coding involved with keyframes, but they allow for much more interesting effects beyond transitions. First, we define the HTML for a button, 
there's the button itself, the heart icon are downloaded from feather icons, a div for a circle and several divs for the particles. We house them inside an absolutely position container div, position it and use border radius and background color to turn those divs into circles. The particles uses nth child to position each in a circle formation. In similar fashion to CSS transitions, we need to define a start animation, but the difference here is that our end animation is defined in a keyframe block. Here's what the keyframe looks like for the circle animation. So what's going on exactly? Here we've defined what the animation looks like at 0%, 50%, 75%, and 100%. You are free to change those percentages, thereby enabling a lot more intricate animations. To compare that with CSS transition where we could only define the 0% state and the 100% animation state. To trigger a keyframe animation, we use a CSS selector to define the animation property. In this case, we'll select the button class when it has a clicked class applied to it. We can then use some JavaScript to set the clicked class on the button. The animation property consists of the duration, timing function, the fill mode, for example, whether it runs forward, reverse, or both, and then the name of the keyframe we wish to use. Now, when we click on the button, the animation is applied to the circle, first initializing its scale and its border color, then gradually increasing the scale and decreasing the border width so that the circle thins out to just the outline. The particle animations is applied in much the same way. We define the start animation, which is simply setting the value of width and height to zero, then we say from 0 to 25%, the animation properties remain at this value. At 60%, we increase the size of the particles. Finally, at the end, the size of the particles decrease again, mimicking firework embers that fizzle away. We've learned how micro interactions can simultaneously delight and guide users in a digital product. We've also seen how we can use readily available HTML and CSS to create performant micro interactions, avoiding the need to use and learn expensive third party software. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the topic. And if you have any workflow tips of your own, please share in the comments below for us all to benefit. Thank you for watching.